These are the words of Rev. Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. I'd like to acknowledge the land we're on during today's commemorative event. Vanderbilt University occupies the traditional hunting grounds and ancestral lands of the Shawnee, Cherokee, Choctaw, Chickasaw, and Creek peoples, land that was ceded during the Treaty of Hopewell from 1795 to 1796. Today, these people continue to have nation boundaries in Oklahoma, North Carolina, and Mississippi, land retained after being forcibly removed due to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Now, hear this prayer for my tradition. While I practice Lutheranism, I also practice earth-based spirituality. An earth-based spirituality 
and in many indigenous traditions around the globe, there are specific land blessings that are made to thank the land and to act in humility and in gratitude for the gifts provided where we live. This is a simple offering, plants harvested here in Middle Tennessee. I invite you to light a candle with me and to listen to these words that the rich religious communities here at Vanderbilt have to offer. Hello, my name is Namra, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the president of the Muslim Students Association. Please hear these words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But even before the barriers of racial segregation are broken down, we will have to do a great deal. I invite you to light a candle with me and hear these words from the Islamic tradition. This is verse 135 from chapter 5 of the Holy Quran. O you who have believed, be persistently standing firm in justice witnesses for God, even if it be against yourselves or parents and relatives. Whether one is rich or poor, God is more worthy of both. So follow not personal inclination, lest you be not just. And if you distort your testimony or refuse to give it, then indeed God is ever with what you do acquainted. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace and blessings be upon each and every person who is watching this video right now. Uh, my name is Omar Sheikh. I'm a junior here at Vandy, um, and I will be reciting a, a brief verse, uh, verse 135 um, from chapter 5 of the Holy Quran. Humans often hate each other because they fear each other. And they fear each other because they don't know each other. Now hear this prayer from my tradition, inspired by a homily given by Salvadoran Roman Catholic Saint Oscar Romero on November 27th of 1977. Jamás debemos predicar violencia, solamente la violencia del amor, la que dejó a Cristo clavado en una cruz, la que se hace cada uno para vencer sus egoísmos y para que no haya desigualdades tan crueles entre nosotros. Esa violencia no es la de la espada, la del odio. Es la violencia del amor, la de la fraternidad, la que quiere convertir las armas en hoces para el trabajo. We should never preach violence, only the violence of love, the one that left Christ nailed to a cross, the one that each one does to overcome their selfishness and so that there are no such cruel inequalities between us. 
that violence is not that of the sword, that of hatred. It is the violence of love, that of solidarity, that wants to turn weapons into sickles for work. In the name of the Father, the Hijo, and the Spirit of Santo. Amen. They don't know each other because they can't communicate with each other. And they can't communicate with each other because they are separated from each other. Now, hear this prayer from the Jewish tradition found in the book of Micah in the Torah. It has been told to you, person, what is good and what the eternal requires of you to do justice, love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Love is understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill for all humanity. And I believe that through such maladjustment, we will be able to emerge from the bleak and desolate midnight of man's inhumanity to each other into the bright and glittering daybreak of freedom and justice. Now hear this prayer from the Christian tradition. This prayer is from Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Book of Prayers, Thou Dear God. O oh God, we thank you for the lives of great saints and prophets in the past who have revealed to us that we can stand up amid the problems and difficulties and trials of life and not give in. We thank you for our four parents who've given us something in the midst of the darkness of exploitation and oppression to keep going. Grant that we will go on with the proper faith and the proper determination of will so that we will be able to make a creative contribution to this world. In the name and spirit of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If we will but do this, we will be participants in the creation of a new society, the creation of a great America. Now hear this prayer from my tradition, a Shanti Mantra from the Upanishads by a fellow student. Om Sahana Vavadu Sahana Bhunattu Sahavirkyam Karavavahai Tejasvi Navadi Tamas Tuma Vitvishavahai Om Shantishantishanti Greetings. Please hear these words from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. But I say to you in my conclusion that there are certain things within our social order and in the world to which I'm proud to be maladjusted, to which all men, people of goodwill must be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. I never intend to adjust myself to the madness of militarism and the self-defeating effects of physical violence. So I say, the world is in desperate need of maladjusted men and women, people. Now hear this poem, Love Isn't, by Pat Parker. I wish I could be the lover you want. Come joyful, bear brightness like summer sun. Instead, I come cloudy, bring pregnant women with no money, bring angry comrades with no shelter. I wish I could take you, run over beaches, lay you in sand and make love to you. Instead, I come rage, bring city streets with wine and blood, bring cops and guns with dead bodies and prison. I wish I could take you, Travel to new lives, kiss niños on tourist buses, sip tequila at sunrise. Instead, I come sad, bring lesbians without lovers, bring sick folk without doctors, bring children without families. I wish I could be your warmth, your blanket. All I can give is my love. I care for you. I care for our world. If I stop caring about one, it would be only a matter of time before I stop loving the other. Thank you. This will be the day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, 
will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Greetings. My name is Racina Gooden, and I am a third year Master of Divinity student and president of the Divinity School's Student Government Association. As we close out our time together, I just wanted to thank you for engaging with Vanderbilt University's 2022 commemorative Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Interfaith Vigil. We have indeed come a long way since 1896, yet we still have much work to do today. I hope this vigil has shown what is possible when we honor differences and come together to do the work most needed in our world. May you be inspired to love, love people, love possibilities, love life, and participate in the creation of a new and better society. Be blessed and keep striving towards justice. Amen and Ashe. Good afternoon. I'm Daniel Diemeyer, Chancellor of Vanderbilt University. It's my honor to welcome everyone to today's keynote address as part of Vanderbilt's annual Martin Luther King Jr. Commemorative Series. We are delighted to welcome our distinguished speaker, acclaimed poet Nikki Finney, who will be introduced in a moment by Vanderbilt's Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Andrew Churchill. A few months before his assassination in 1968, Dr. King said that he wanted to leave behind a committed life and to be remembered above all for his love of humanity and service to others. As we gather to honor Dr. King today, we affirm our own lifelong commitment to his values of peace and justice. And we ask how we can work together in our time for one another and for a better world. In this new year of 2022, the world continues to grapple with the hardships and upheaval of the COVID pandemic. We are also witnessing deep political divisions that threaten to cause grievous harm to our country's democratic institutions. And along with this, the acts of violence and social injustice that have taken place in recent years still weigh profoundly on our hearts. Our society once again needs the kind of healing and change that Dr. King so eloquently championed. As the world remembers Dr. King this year, we are called as a nation to examine openly and honestly where we stand in relation to his enduring legacy. Here in Nashville, that legacy is alive and ever present. It is with us at the lunch counters, about a mile away here from campus, where six decades ago, local college students courageously stood up against racial segregation. That brave act of nonviolent protest, informed by the teachings of Reverend James Lawson, changed the course of our city and our nation. It was carried out by those who emerged as some of the most powerful voices for justice in our time, people like Diane Nash and the late Representative John Lewis. In 2021, Many of these former students returned to Nashville, joining our community and local and national leaders in a ceremony to rename the former Fifth Avenue as Representative John Lewis Way. That same year, Vanderbilt announced the founding of the James Lawson Institute for the Research and Study of Nonviolent Movements right here at Vanderbilt University, which we will formally launch this spring. The new institute firmly rooted in our region's rich civil rights history and the rigor of higher education is an example of what we take to be our responsibility as a university to the kinds of discourse innovation and personal growth that take place on our diverse campus and within our broader community we seek to enable discovery increase understanding and empower future leaders to help solve the complex problems facing our society. We believe that this is the most essential service we can provide 
And we do so in the spirit of Dr. King's unshakable faith in humanity and with the knowledge that through our work together, his legacy will march on. Thank you to today's speakers and thank you to everyone joining us here. And I will now turn over the program to Vice Chancellor Churchill to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Chancellor Biermeyer, for the opening words and allowing me to be part of this important and auspicious occasion. I'm Andre Churchwell, Vanderbilt's Vice Chancellor for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion and Chief Diversity Officer. Thank you to everyone joining us today. I am thrilled to be part of this event as part of Vanderbilt's annual commemoration of the legacy and transformative work of Martin Luther King Jr. We are here to celebrate Dr. King and look ahead to a greater world by reflecting on the history and adv advocacy that has brought us to this moment. I did not know Martin Luther King Jr., but as a native Nashvilleian growing up during the civil rights movement, I spent much of my early years following and being influenced by his career. I am confident that while he would be humbled and honored that we view him as a symbol and guide for social justice, he would very likely remind us that he was merely human. Rather than focus too much on the actions and words of this notable man, he would exhort us to take the best of his ideas and actions, to create our own moral compass and build a beloved community where all belong. You may recall some of those most poignant ideas that he reflected, that only love can defeat hate and only light can drive out darkness, that we should never demonize a people or person, but seek to understand them, and that the way forward for you and those like him who seek to change the world lies in education of both the mind and the heart. As an institution of higher education, it is crucial that as we focus on the education of the mind, we give equal weight to the education of the heart. This requires that we invest our lives completely in that work through a daily commitment to temperance, reverence, wisdom, courage, justice, and all the virtues that make us humane and caring. We gather as an institution and as a community today for this reason, to engage in education of the heart and continue to working toward the reconciliation, redemption, and creation of the beloved community that King envisioned. This perfectly leads me to introduce us to our guests who will discuss more on today's theme, where we belong, building the beloved community. It's my great honor to introduce our esteemed guest and faculty moderator for today's event. Our event will be a conversation between two incredible professors and poets. The first is poet and author Nikki Finney. Finney is the John H. Bennett Jr. Chair in Creative Writing and Southern Letters at the University of South Carolina. In addition, she served as poet and professor at the University of Kentucky and visiting professor at Berea and Smith Colleges. She is also a founding member of the Afrolation Poets, a place for poets of color in Appalachia. Finney's work includes the arenas of Black Girl Genius Unrecognized, Black History Misplaced and Forgotten, and the stories of women who prefer to jump instead of ride the traditional tracks of polite and acceptable society. She has won numerous awards, including the Penn American Open Book Award in 1996, the Elizabeth O'Neill Verner Award for the Arts in South Carolina in 2016, and the 2011 National Book Award for Poetry for her work, Head Off and Split. Joining her in conversation is Vanderbilt's own Major Jackson, Director of Creative Writing and, and the Gertrude Conway Vanderbilt Professor of English. Jackson is the author of five volumes of poetry, most recently, The Absurd Man, published in 2020 a recipient of the fellowships from the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University. Jackson has been awarded the Pushcart Prize and a Whiting Writers Award, and has been honored by the Pew Fellowship in the Arts and the Witterbiner Foundation in conjunction with the Library of Congress. And now it is my pleasure to welcome Nikki Finney. Good afternoon, everyone. To the communities of Nashville, 
of Vanderbilt University and the world. Welcome to all within the sound of my voice and a glorious, joyous natal day to Dr. King and his entire family. A deep thank you to the Martin Luther King Jr. Committee at Vanderbilt University for inviting me to this annual university and community high celebration for this astounding scholar of justice. I believe this celebration has been happening since 1985. What a legacy. A man who came along right when the country needed him. But dare I say, that country was not always ready to hear what Martin Luther King Jr. was ready to say. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the mother load. There are many different associations made over time and culture regarding this word and what it represents. The mother load I speak of today is that endless, profound, golden vein of human liberatory knowledge passed on from one generation to the next. That understanding that our mothers nurtured, cultivated, and spread out over the world by way of song, parable, axiom, and even sometimes folded invisibly into sweet potato pies that were over on the side, cooling on the counter. For as long as there has been a black woman standing in the sunlight and moonlight of this world, there has been her wise, critical understanding of that world. There is a book that was gifted to me many years ago entitled The Voice of Black America, edited by historian Philip S. Foner. I don't know if you've ever seen or read it. It is quite a tome of a book, 1,205 pages long, published in 1972, containing, at least in Mr. Foner's estimation, the major speeches of African-Americans given in the United States from 1797 to 1971. Priceless in its overview of over 200 years of black thought in one place. But I had to turn 662 pages and travel 100 years before finding Mary Church Terrell's essay, The Progress of Colored Women. I wondered about the voices of black women and where in the world they had been deposited before page 662. I am a deep keeper of the world of black women's ideas and words. So this was not a random question for me to ask. Just as it was not a random question for me to wonder what in the world might the mother load have to do with the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let's go back, 1619. A ship arrives near Point Comfort, Virginia. The White Lion is carrying 20 to 30 captive Africans who are traded to Virginia colonists for provisions. They will become the first enslaved Africans within what will become the United States of America. Among them is a man named Anthony and a woman named Isabella. This is American History 101, even if it does not appear in the American History Textbook 101. Sister Isabella's factual presence and name is always near me when I think of the influence of 400 years of Black women on this country. I often wonder about all of what she brought across in the suitcase of her body. There were no books that came with Isabella, but I promise you there was great wisdom. Despite the tragic omission by the literary establishment, Black women have been expressing their ideas, feelings, and interpretations about their experience in America, about the sun and the moon up above, about the biscuit color of a magnolia blossom in May, 
about what it means to read and write, about giving birth and being loved, about inventing a new version of the ironing board, about getting men to the moon, about the perpetual longing to be in a beloved community one fine day, about life and living and death itself. The combined forces of race, sex, and economic discrimination have imposed upon Black women a severely disadvantaged status. But nevertheless, Black women have created and cultivated a set of ethical and moral values that defy the status quo. They contain in a brilliant wellspring of perpetual and dry long soul sagacity that has allowed them and anybody within the sound of their voices to prevail against all odds. When they could not publish their thoughts and feelings in books, women still wrote things out, composed, if you will, if they had to, in the bellies of slave ships, they wrote out lesson plans about black futures on washboards and poured out what made good common sense inside the living breathing walls of their children, churches and organizations. In every culture, there are prophets and many of these prophets are women native anthropologists, spiritual guides, human beings cut out of the mainstream because they were not considered valuable. People who went conveniently unseen and unheard, sometimes we know their names and sometimes we attribute their knowledge to others. I passionately believe their unrecognized intelligence pollinates the universe, as well as its most distinguished champions. This beloved community that you say you want to build in Nashville, this beloved community that the world so desperately needs will require remembering and including the voices and the wisdom of this mother load whether we know their names or not, whether they are labeled anonymous or Isabella. There are long, incredibly invisible lists of black women at the center of every American state's long historical fight for full-scale civil and human justice in this country. Women who led the church and the community and the movement, including thousands of Black domestic workers. 90% of Black women in the South in the 1960s were domestic workers. Women working in all areas of the community also, including Septima Poinsett Clark, Shirley Sherrod, McCree Harris, Johnny Carr, Thelma Glass, Diane Nash of Nashville, Georgia Gilmore, Joanne Robinson, and Maude Ballou, just to name a few. Mrs. Ballou was secretary for Dr. King from 1955 to 1960, some of the most violent years of the movement. Ballou was known as Dr. King's right hand. She was also number 21 on the list of persons most vulnerable to violent attacks by the KKK. Dr. King himself was number one. In 2015, in an interview where she spoke about her life, Balu said she didn't have any time to worry about the white supremacists watching her nightly through the church windows because there was so much work to get done. That reminds me of something my aunt Baby Toy used to say. She was a good citizen of the mother load. She would say, Believe nothing you see and half of what you hear. It was a reminder to me to remain focused on what was in front of me 
and not whatever was on fire over to the side. Before bold black boys like Martin Luther King Jr. would grow up and change the world with their sharp political and human understandings, there were black women leaning over pots of food or brushing his hair before heading off to school or going over his homework when he came home from school or straightening his bow tie before Sunday school whispering old and true things in his ear, things he would need to remember as he grew and took on his own sound. Can you hear them standing at the door as he walked away from their spotless house every morning? This is what they said. Remember now, a steady drop of water will wear a hole in a rock. Whatever that boy was going to be would include her firecracker sharp penetrating wisdom. Alberta Williams King was Martin Luther King Jr.'s mother. The glue for Ebenezer Baptist Church and the King family. Born in 1904, a graduate of Spelman, Hampton and Morris Brown institutions. She served as the organist at Ebenezer from 1932 to 1972. I don't think we talk about Miss Alberta enough. As a young woman, she was a member of several social justice organizations, including the NAACP. Mrs. King lived her good life of struggle only to be shot and killed while playing the Lord's Prayer in Ebenezer Baptist Church on June 30th, 1974. The mother of Alberta Williams King was Jenny Celeste Parks, born in Georgia in 1873, eight years after the end of the Civil War. And her mother, Dr. King's great-grandmother, Miss Fanny, born into slavery in Georgia in 1830, just these three black women alone cover nearly 150 years of being treated as a third class citizen in the region of the country where segregation and lynching and Jim Crow shaped every child's consciousness, no matter the contents of their character or the color of their skin. 150 years of brilliant mother load understanding. One of my favorite quotes by Dr. King was surely born out of the great circle of women who tended close his early days. He said this, I'm proud to be maladjusted and wish all men of good will would be maladjusted until the good society is realized. I never intend to adjust myself to segregation and discrimination. I never intend to become adjusted to religious bigotry. As children, we are shaped by the constellation of human planets swirling around us from the prayers and from other dark womanish matter. Before the Prince of Peace and future King of Nonviolence would grow to speak of love in all its many complexities and continue on to stamp the world with his brilliant and eloquent understandings. He surely would first need to know love's many rainbow colors. The black women in his life would teach him, remind him, recite to him, and years later, perhaps, at least in this poet's estimation, as he sat in a Birmingham jail cell, composing an essay that would claim its place in the world. As one of the most direct and provocative letters the world had ever read, those teachings from those natural and luminous constellations of Black women would surely guide his words. The mother load, the rich golden words of our mothers is not some kind of insignificant trickling tributary of cute sidebar things. Oh no, for me and for others, 
the deep understanding our mothers had, their prophecy, what they understood about the world, what it meant to be human in a world that did not see them as fully human, how they refused to not connect themselves to the wide universe of precious life swirling and going on around them, that precious life that others refuse to connect them to, <laughs> they refuse to be left out of the story. They refused to die or disappear, even if they were left over on the other side. Instead, they would pass on the story of the fox. They would tell a new high school or college graduate girl, don't you take any wooden nickels. Look inside your hand when somebody hands you something. And thereby they would create and pull forward sayings and beliefs that their children swallowed whole, that those children then wore out into the mean, uneven American streets like new armor. The words of the mother load are filled with common sense. They are basic understandings of the most complicated of human conditions. Here's one. Common courtesy is do a dog, one of them teaches. A guide to the kinship of humanity, on a map for reciprocity and fairness and individuality. They were an almanac of human warnings to keep close, no matter the decade, passed on since the very first human mouth opened to speak. Oh yes, I believe their voices should make up the pages of the book of the beloved community. Here's one mama liked to say, if you lie down with dogs, you will get up with fleas. And another one that Aunt Baby Toy always kept just under her peppermint tongue. You know, an empty wagon, always rattles. Clandestine theology, circumspect, compact and wise. Black woman nuggets of truth. Before there was a voting rights act to fight for or meetings with presidents or garbage workers unions or Nobel Peace Prize receptions. There was the belief one young man surely had to have within himself that came from those around him who would never raise their hands or pat themselves on their backs or take any much deserved credit for what they stuffed his pockets with. Those maternal prophets with their right or left hands often centered in the bend of their backs, weary from washing and cleaning and playing the organ, doing and ironing and scrubbing and adding and subtracting and reading and resisting and shielding and configuring their Easter hats just so. And dreaming first so he could dream out loud to the world. Next, imagine this moment with me. Let's say it's 1845. There are two enslaved black men on a plantation somewhere in the South, doesn't matter where. Both have just finished a hellish day of 24 hours of work in the fields. They are leaning together in the last flash of sunlight. Mr. Elijah says, Junebug said a mighty thing to me this morning. Mr. Joseph asks, what'd she say? Mr. Elijah answers, good black, don't crack. And they bend into each other like brothers with a secret handshake to share and make it through one more night. And that moment would be their only smile on that brutal day. And Miss Junebug's life-saving authorial voice on the subject of the beauty of black skin would live on through eight generations ahead and straighten out many a restless, wounded, heart. 
that the king's words are resonant and lyrical. They made us feel and know our bodies were always on the line. Oh, America, he said, how often have you taken necessities from the masses and given luxuries to the classes? I was raised by and in the ocean of the sea that was the black mother load. I know the exquisite quiet power of these words that are rarely attributed to black women. I know they spoke them. I don't know if they wrote them. I know how they can drill down in you and take seed and flourish. I know their power to stamp something right and robust in a child forever. I know how the mind of a black woman can hold whole galaxies of humankind and then pass on those galaxies like a cup of holy water. I am a black woman. I watch and study and listen to black women. I like and love black women. I know the sound of black women and I recognize their voices inside of other voices. What came out of the fictive Miss June Bug's mouth was not hyperbole. It was black motherlode physiology philosophy. Her exquisite understanding and sharp perception of her own body that no book taught her, a small but necessary part of the roadmap of truth. Of her understanding that a black body kept holding on to its beautiful self in a world that kept whipping it to the ground. What will be the commandments of our beloved community? What truths will we use to design how we live? What will we name the streets? Will there be more monuments to lost wars? Will we care more about January 6 than January 15? Will the women have a long house for all their invisible wisdom? Will anyone ask the Navajo or the Santo Domingo, the Yemasi, the Kumbahi, how does it feel to still live on this bloody land? Will the transgender community be allocated land where they can feel safe? Will the LGBTQ marriages survive? Before the iron and the steel beams go up, we have so much work to do on ourselves. We will need to spend less time on TikTok and more time on what the woman who first said this believed. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Womanist theology, have you heard of it? It comes out of the same oral tradition as the rich verdant history of the mother load. Dr. Katie Geneva Cannon, the first African-American woman quietly ordained in the United Presbyterian Church nearly 50 years ago, founded a branch of theology that did not previously exist and went on to teach and inspire an entire generation of womanist theologians working today. One of them is my friend, Dr. Emily Towns, Vanderbilt's finest. These women believe and preach this profound oral tradition in their daily and weekly messages. I am not a theologian, but I will forever be Dr. Katie's poet as long as I walk this earth. I'm a poet and a woman whose life is wrapped in the husk of the mother load. Dr. Katie left us physically in 2018, but I still talk with her every day as I make my way. Dr. Katie, here's my favorite saying, one monkey, don't stop, no show. In a precious video called Thinking With Our Hearts and Feeling With Our Brains, Katie Cannon describes what happened in the 1980s while attending Union Theological Seminary and work, working on her PhD. She tried to use the golden vein of the mother load as her research material, but was stopped by her professor, a member of the old guard who had no interest in building a beloved community. How dare you write a paper, he said, that causes us to feel. 
She was stopped in her tracks. Her emotionally factual material that pushed the boundaries of what was traditionally found in books would not be allowed into the conversation. Her emotionally factual materials based on the annals of the human body in survival, in spiritual fortitude, in the desires of the body to live and push on through. Her luminous thousand year old ideas passed directly down from her own great grandmother her grandmother, her mother, who still lives on today at 103. All this wisdom from her direct personal mother load. She was told by her professor, if she did not change her data, that was not considered data, she would receive a failing grade. She relayed this to her mother, Miss Corrine Lytle Cannon, who said, baby, when your head is in the lion's mouth, move carefully. Katie Cannon changed her paper back to the lifeless bag of dry bones paper he wanted. It wasn't time for her to draw her line in the sand. Come later, Dr. Katie Cannon became the first black woman to receive a PhD from Union Theological Seminary. She knew the mother load would live on. I tell you it's true when they say, every shut eye ain't sleep. When Martin Luther King Jr. spoke, he made us feel with our minds and with our bodies, our black bodies, our white bodies, our brown bodies, our wanting to be free bodies. I believe he too was deeply fed by rich gold vein of the mother load. Dr. King was not afraid to make us feel and know everything that was at stake and was willing to use all types of wisdom from many different kinds of prophets to get us there. A riot, he said, is the language of the unheard. We Who Believe in Freedom is a book filled with the life of another daughter of the wise mother load, Bernice Johnson Regan, one of the great filled with resistance voices of the civil rights movement. Miss Bernice was a member of the Freedom Singers in the Albany, Georgia movement. She sang at hundreds of human rights rallies during the 1960s. The book is also the story of the founding of the great a cappella women's group, Sweet Honey in the Rock. She writes so brilliantly about what was at stake. There are lessons in her words for those of us who desire to create a beloved community. Here's what she says. I was keenly aware of the trauma that some of our early sponsors went through in organizing a platform we would accept. It was coalition work of the riskiest kind. Sweet Honey was a group of Black women singers who had something to say about the world we live in. We had to learn on our feet how to be who we were, how to own ourselves, how to not allow anyone else to define who we were. Being in a coalition Miss Bernie says, well, not a place to feel at home. I love this, this line. It's not a place to feel at home. Coalition work is hard, she said, and often threatening but necessary to force change within a society such as ours. Our early sponsors, Miss Bernie said, tried to make us them. They wanted to rename us. When we said we were a group of Black women singers, it was as if we had said nothing, that we were still in need of a title. I think the desire to rename us was not malicious, but came from a position of cultural privilege. Miss Bernie said, when we insisted on our name be Sweet Honey in the Rock, an ensemble of Black women singers, we were asked, well, what's wrong with being called a feminist? Miss Bernice's answer? What's wrong with being a black radical woman and calling your organization an ensemble of black women singers? She said she explained that our radicalness was rooted in our history and models and that the words and phrases we use were used by our mothers and our mother's mothers and we wanted to always name the connection. She also explained that in a struggle for justice in this society, we would be on the same side, but we were not the same. 
And so Sweet Honey in the Rock had to name herself. Good folks, how to build a beloved community is not complicated. It's not out of our reach. It's not way over on the other side, not hidden in a book. It is deep inside of us, passed on to us from our mothers still waiting recognition. We know their wisdom, whether we had a wise one or not. We are often too shy to repeat that wisdom, to believe in it with our minds and our teeth. We believe we might be judged, seen as not intellectual enough. We laugh at the simplicity of these old sayings, wrinkle our noses at their twisting angled human knowledge. But I say, we haven't pondered deeply into their fabric enough. And we haven't always attributed them to the right human beings. Okay, here's one last one. And it's the one that I believe should be carved right over the front of the newly erected beloved community center door, right for everyone to see and read and think about as we all walk in before the work starts in earnest. If I can't help you, I will not hurt you. Thank you for listening today and happy birthday, O oh, great man of peace. Seriously, thank you so much for that. And I, I do think the lineage that you speak, those wisdoms that come through us in Black women's sayings is, is such an important part of the bloodstream and the life of, of our struggles, our quest for freedoms. And, um, and thinking about too, the women behind Dr. King, that's a radical, radical reflection. Hello, doing that lineage? <laughs> I'm like, they might not let me continue. I might get, you know, <laughs> but I'm not scared, Major. <laughs> I am not afraid of the truth. I am not. I know you're not. I know you're not. In fact, my first question has to do with um, you and I have an inherited a glorious legacy. And yes, Dr. King is an important part and figure and pillar of that, uh, of that legacy. Um, what we were taught in the fables that you were talking about and those folk sayings is to A, protect ourselves, acknowledge the humanity, of others and their distinct uh, freedoms and to recognize their humanity along with their cultural histories. Yes. I'm wondering, thinking about uh, this injunction by Michael S. Harper that we have to place ourselves in the continuum of consciousness thinking about that and thinking about what you just, the gift that you just gave us. I'm curious about who are those folks behind Nikki Finney who helped pass on those ideals of Dr. King and the larger ideals of, of the struggle for social and racial justice, um, the struggle for uh, dignity in this country. Who, who would you name behind you? The first thing, the first person I would name would, the first persons I would name would be my mother and my father. I mean, direct, you know, bloodline. You get this, You, uh, if you want to eat at this table or if you want me to take you to school. But, but the thing major, I was born in 1957. I went to Catholic school my first three years because that's where many of the black kids went right in my community. And then I'm right in the heart of the civil rights movement. So my father comes home one day and he goes, baby, we're going to another school. And I'm like, oh no, we're not. My, my friends are here. My girl is here. My, you know, my, my, I got my buddies. He says, no, this is bigger than that. 
And so my entire worldview started where you have to not do the thing you may want to do, but you must do the thing that the community needs you to do. Mm -hmm. So Vietnam mm -hmm. War was happening, civil rights, I'm right in the heart of all that. I get home after school, my mom won't have the TV on because she knows what's on the TV. She has us reading, she has us doing art projects. She has, she's a, 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 a artist herself, right? And so she's like, move your hands, go out in, this, in, the, in the backyard, think of some ideas you wanna talk about at the dinner table later. So they're constantly understanding what to keep from us and what to make sure we're in touch with. Mm -hmm. So I feel incredibly fortunate, not lucky, fortunate to have been born in that house at that moment in American history, because it shaped me. Mm -hmm. it, it, it hammered in me the kind of poet, the kind of artist that I wanted to become. Mm -hmm. Along with that, Jet Magazine, Ebony Magazine. I, I say these names now and my, my students go, what? Who? You know, they, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. But these were our history books. These were the direct line of Black history coming into our small Southern lives to teach us, sit up straight. You have nothing to be ashamed. Anybody calls you a name, that's not your name. I mean, that is that was my preparation for life. Mm -hmm. So I had all of those you know, Robeson and Baldwin and, uh, uh, you know, Mrs. Bethune was, was born right down the road from me. All of this is in the air, in the water, in church, in community centers. I mean, before integration uh, started to disassemble that Black world, and it did, we had little uh, satellite black worlds all around me. So I was in the continuum. I knew I was in the continuum. There was no doubt that I was where I was supposed to be. There was no doubt with my parents, there were my, my grandparents, both sides of my family were black farmers. So, so in they're Virginia, teaching. And huh? South Carolina, and two Virginia, states. Two states, yeah, Virginia, South cool. Carolina. So it's not like I didn't also get the message that you have to learn how to feed yourself because nobody's going to feed you. You have to, you know, that whole, um, all, all of the Kwanzaa principles were, before they were Kwanzaa principles were around my life, you know, and I feel very fortunate that um, I didn't know it then how I would partake of them and how um, profound they would become for me, but mm. they became, they, they were foundational to everything I have written after. Mm -hmm. I, that, re, that reminds me of the fact that not only did you have it in, in your household, that calling, that urging, but you had folks who mentored you, Dr. Gloria Wade Gales at Talladega College um, in Atlanta, uh, the great Tony K. Bambara, among others. And in fact, the first time I saw you, I don't know if I told you this, but the first time I saw you was at the memorial for Tony K. Bambara. I was working at a place called the Painted Bride Art Center. And my that's where it was. That's where it was. That's right. And I was responsible for sound and lighting on stage and also ushering, ushering. Sonia Sanchez said, Major. Toni Morrison is going to arrive in a limo on the side. We want to escort her through the, through the rear of the building, right? So Tony gets out of limousine. And then, ah, man, I can't even tell you. She gets out, full head of dredge, just stepping out. And then right behind her. Do you remember who was there? No. Miss Davis. <laughs> you were back doing that? I was back there and Baraka was there, Sonia was there, a bunch of folks was in there. And the celebration of Tony K. Bambara's life just brought out so many people, much in the same way that when Baldwin died yes, and that memorial and celebration yes. brought out lots of writers, political figures. One of the brightest lights I remember was Nikki Finney. I was so moved by your words and your dedication to her. 
Uh, there was a lot of important people there. Yeah. Nikki Finney was, in my mind, one of the brightest lights because you represented that next generation. Something was being passed on. Do you recall that day? Oh my gosh, Major, it was, a, it was, it was one of those moments that alters you. Yeah. So I flew to Philly. I walked in the Painted Bride with some other friends. I said, I'm gonna be there because I had been talking to her mm -hmm. um, before she passed away. And I had this conversation going. She needed a pen. I sent her a pen. She needed some paper. I sent her a hat. You know, that's where that quote that is at the beginning mm -hmm. of, well, of Head yeah. Off and Split, yeah. where she says, Nikki, on a postcard, do not leave the arena to the fools. Mm -hmm. Come on. So I'm standing in line and there's 50 of us waiting to say something about what, who Tony Cade was to, you know, who she was to us. I'm standing with people she met in the elevator, people she met in the grocery store, people who she met at the water um, department paying water bills. <laughs> I'm talking, I'm, I'm, they're like, well, how do you know her? I'm like, well, I went to her workshop, you know, trying to be all kind of special. And they're like, well, I met her at the water department and she told me I could go back to school and I did and she changed my life. And I had written on a little tiny, I still have this piece of paper, what, you know, what I said in that moment. And I'm looking up on the stage and I'm seeing Morrison and all these great dignitaries, right? Great, great starlights in the community. But this is what I have to tell you that happened last night. Last night, a young black woman novelist, um, Chantal James, first novel coming out, right? I, someone called me a month ago and said, well, there's this new novelist, Chantal James. She's like 35 years old and, and she you know, can't find anybody to be in conversation with in her first book. It says Sankofa Books in Washington, DC. I said, oh, I'll do it. I, I got this because I come out of that tradition. Yes, yes. And she's the next generation of, and she's getting all this wonderful you know, conversation about her books. And I'm like, Tony Cade, I got this. <laughs> So I feel, you know, I, I, I couldn't, I couldn't write my life. Yeah. It happened because I, I feel, and I want to, I want to, can I read you this? This is yes, like, please. when I saw this question, I said, oh, I got to read this to major. This is from Howard Thurman, the sound of the genuine 1980 commencement address at Spelman college, a year after I graduated from Talladega college, there is something in every one of you that waits listens for the sound of the genuine in yourself. And if you cannot hear it, you will never find whatever it is for which you are searching. And if you hear it and then do not follow it, it was better that you had never been born. Come on. Wait, one more line. You are the only you that has ever lived. Your idiom is the only idiom of its kind in all of existence. And if you cannot hear the sound of the genuine in you, you will all your life spend your days on the ends of strings that somebody else pulls. <laughs> Major. Yeah. I heard that when I was 21. Oh. So I'm telling you, Dr. Gales, Sonia Sanchez's poetry out in the world. Tony K. Bambara saying, sit down in her workshop, only writing workshop I've ever attended in my life. The work of Morrison, the words of Baldwin, my mother and father putting their hands in my spine, teaching me who I was, love child. That's what my daddy yeah, called right. me. He called me love child. He said, people gonna call you names out in the world, but I want you to remember that you are a love child, that you come from love, out of love, and will be following that path the rest of your life. Well, that's that's exactly you're getting at you getting at the heart of something that I'm that I wanted to try and focus on here, and and it pretty much has to do with that uh, in concert with the beloved community and the theme of this particular uh, uh, MLK commemorative event, inclusive community, yes. and that's one in which everyone is valued and nurtured and seen and respected and given a place at the table. Right. And the fact that um, before this particular moment, 
we had a structure and you said some of it was disabled by integration, that's very true. But we had parents, we had artists, we had teachers who in a way put their arm metaphorically as well literally. as literally around us to assure because there were forces around us. Come on. That was out to destroy whatever humanity was in there. And so what I marvel, particularly with your, with your book, and this is where my next question goes, I marvel that in all of your books, your oeuvre, mm -hmm. I see Nikki Finney as a young girl, deeply, deeply reflective and wondrous, and how that's nurtured through family, through your mentors, into a young woman who's coming into her voice, yeah. into someone who eventually finds that voice and language that, that, you know, head off and split did it for me. I mean, I was with Rice and I was with On the Wings of God, but head off and split did it for me in language that said, this is you, this is me. And I so appreciate how you have over the course of your career underscored your humanity and your selfhood. And I think that's what this work is about. I think that's what it's about. Along with that, could you discuss Love Child's hotbed of occasional poetry and how that came to be? It is for readers who haven't discovered this gorgeous book. It is a tapestry of notes from your dad. Yes. It's a tapestry of, of Black artifacts. Yes. Right, that I feel are both personal as well as part of our national uh, record. It's also photography, and that really surprised me. So it feels like this artistic document. How did the book come about as a, as a concept? And could you talk to us about poetry, particular as archive? Yes. Poetry as provocation? Yes. Poetry as restoration, which, in, which I read when reading this book, it felt like both healing and uplift. Mm, mm, wow. Um, for my entire life, I have saved the things that have my reflection on them. Photographs, scraps of paper, uh, first terrible poems, uh, letters from teachers that say, she would be a good student if she wasn't always looking out the window. <laughs> Photographs of uh, my mother at 25 or 26. And I, when, I, when I'm wondering late, much later on, what was she thinking about as a young woman? She was a young mother, what, in a, in a crazy violent world. What is my father? Why is he always smoking those Salem cigarettes? What, what, what weight was on his shoulders? I was the child in the family with the interior space that was as large as the continent of Africa. I was quiet. You didn't get to know me by my voice. You got to see me scribbling. So my whole life, I feel like I've been documenting not just my life, but the life of the community that sheltered me and protected me and cheered me on when I stood in front of the church and read the worst poem in the world and said, that's a poet. Who else, Major, is going to save my life if I don't save it? And I mean the things that make my life my life. I knew that I had come into this world in a place where little Black girls were not protected by other people. The image was there, right? The sound of that was there. So I decided because I was a scribbler and because I loved the journal book that I would document my life here, not to be the poet that would speak in 2020 at the Dr. King celebration at Vanderbilt University and speak with the wonderful poet, Major Jackson. I wanted to do this for me because I had seen everybody in my community have a job. Everybody had a job. Mr. 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 Brown, who was the electrician, not only strung these lights to our houses and brought light in, but in, in church, he also 
kept the, the books, the journal, the record book for the church. He had a job. So as I got older, I kept saying, what's my job gonna be? I saw my parents going off to you know, hold posters and, 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 and walk in civil rights uh, marches that the younger, younger kids did not always go to. What's my job? Where's my piece of paper? Where's my pencil? I got it. Let me see, what do I see happening out in the world? So children are different. My brothers have no uh, memory of, of this, but I have great exact memory of it. And so your sensibilities, I think my sensibilities kicked in at this moment in my life when I moved back home to South Carolina because my mother called me and said, your father has been diagnosed with Alzheimer's we are going to have to do something because I'm not sure I can take care of him by myself. I said, mom, I'll be home. She said, you have a job, you're in Kentucky. You've been there 20 years. I said, I'll be home. I had been preparing for this major entire life. I said, my father will not be in an institution. I appreciate those institutions deeply, but I am going to take care of him because I, he gave me the name Love Child. I'm going home, take care of him. I found a job in South Carolina, I moved home. And as I was taking care of him, I would come home and I'd be working on poems. And it, it occurred to me that I needed to take out his box of letters. I found a box of 400 letters that my father had written me since the, I left home at the age of 18 and moved to California and Kentucky and all these other places. He had my name, he had my, I had 20 addresses. And each one was a love letter. And I realized that the book I thought I was working on was not that book. Mm -hmm. The book I needed to work on was the book that talked to me about the archival power of a black family uh, instilling in their little girl the idea that she could be what she wanted to be. I felt that was more important than the other book that I was working on, which happened to be actually a book about um, the natural world. Mm. I, I, I'm mm. a, I'm a, I'm a, you know, flowers mm. and whales, and uh, I'm, I'm drawn to that. I'm born, you know, two seconds from the ocean, and so it wasn't that those poems couldn't happen in this book. It's just that they had a different context. Yeah. And so I saw it, one of the things that made me burst into tears when I first saw that book was that the, the um, press surprised me and put his handwriting love child on the cover which he had the most beautiful handwriting in the world how come we don't talk about handwriting yeah, anymore right, Major? Right, come right. on <laughs> you know and so i thought and and this is the feeling that i have about that book probably i mean you can't you can't put one child next to another child you can't do that but in terms of what i wanted to say and what i wanted to save you know it ends with this long tome you know, on George J. Stinney Jr., the 14-year-old black child who was the youngest human being uh, put to death in this country in the 1940s. It, it ends with that poem. And I thought, nobody's gonna read this poem. It's too long, you know? And that book did not stir the waters in terms of the larger, you know, country, which I, I wasn't trying to. But what it did was I have a file of, handwritten notes that have come to me from people who found it and thought, you can do this? You can write a book like this? And that's the way I felt when I found Miss Clifton's Generations. Mm -hmm. I thought you can put photography next to Walt Whitman, next to the journey of your grandmother, this black woman who walked from the South up, the, up I-95 that wasn't I-95 yet? permission that's right I, I think it's the book of permission and if I was going to see that book finished um and so I started going to my archive the, all the the boxes that I had saved all my life it's a long story it's a great question no one's ever asked me that really since we um since we launched it in in 2020 but it's it's um it's a precious um it's a precious repository of mm -hmm. black life for me mm -hmm. well that's <clears throat> that portrait of your family and that portrait of your nurturance is, I feel, one of the important gifts uh, of the book because it models it models a way of 
A, instructive for those who have a contorted view of Black families. Yes. Right? It yes. kind of corrects the record. Right. I, I want to get to that in a, in a second. But your theme, the mother load, mm. um, I want to see if the, I can tie this question to your Okay. Team. Because so much of what you were talking about is how we as individuals and as communities, our, our maybe what we take for granted, and let's call that privilege, the okay. privileges we have today, enjoy today, is co-sponsored by somebody back there, whether we know it or not. And not only the privileges, material, uh, emotional, otherwise, but also our interior lives, which in the case of Nikki Finney, allows her to be that kind of interior kind of person to kind of reflect and find the language and find the words uh, to give um, uh, shape to who she is and maybe even to write herself into the future. And that's the marvel people don't understand that about, about writing sometimes is that, yeah. is that writing writes, writes us. Right. In his introduction to The World is Round, your book, I believe your fourth book, uh, Kevin Kwashi, wonderful person. I can't mm. wait to meet him. He makes this observant and gorgeous remark about you. He says, what is absorbing about Finney's poems is the great care they take in showcasing that the inner life, the storehouse of our deepest human ambitions and neediness is a habitat of agency. Mm -hmm. That is for me, where we create in our efforts to give a portrait of our selfhood and all of our beautiful and strange and weird and tragic dimensions, somehow that is where we find power and generative possibilities. For me, that kind of transcendent, transparent uncovering of one's history, which you do in all of your books, you name Uncle Freddie, <laughs> Aunt Nina, you just introduced me again to Aunt Baby Toy, all those folks, one's histories, one's soul, always emerges as an act of love when I read your books. That inner life is what we are working to protect. The beloved community is trying to protect those inner lives. Please say more to us about writing as care and liberation. We live in a society that would prefer to be entertained. Part of what I'm talking about in the talk about, you know, TikTok versus the messages of Aunt Baby Toy. I mean, I tell these to my students, I've been saying it, I've been in the classroom 32 years. I've been saying this for 32 years. Sometimes it, att it attaches major, you know, to a student. They're like, wait, I got a grandfather who used to say stuff like that. or wait, I'm from Ireland and my aunt in Ireland says stuff like this. I'm like, the Irish are like the, the most incredible storytellers. And then we get into this conversation and we cross genres and cross cultures and cross gender and cross, 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 cross. <laughs> because what it comes down to is that people are entertained in a capitalist society. That's mm -hmm. truth. Mm -hmm. But what they want is the story that illuminates their humanity and connects them to somebody that they think they have nothing in common with. That's right. That's what I care That's about. Right. Yeah. I don't care if anybody, I don't, I'm not doing this, you know, so somebody will, will discover me. I'm doing this so that somebody can discover themselves. Reach. <laughs> and that is not easy to teach to a young person who is in a society driven by that entertainment dollar sign. Mm -hmm. But we who have been taught, you know, the best of, of what it means to be human, stay the course because we understand that if one person hears it, then we have been successful. You know, I, I don't know how else to say it other than that. The stories connect us. That's what you're saying there. And if you tell the truth, if you, if, if you, if you are telling the truth and if you are not, 
you know, um, uh, uh, zeroing in on that stereotypical thing that will make people buzz and pop and like you or, you know, all of that. But if you are telling the truth, I mean, yeah, and that is yeah. always yeah. easy to do. It's never easy to do. We are having a difficult time in our public life in yes. speaking to each other in ways in which we can hear each other right and i'm wondering about i often wonder about what is the source of the discord that does not allow us to engage in discourse we're listening to each other across all manner of divides is a valued and cherished moment vanderbilt's goals in events like this one the mlk commemorative event and the chancellor's lecture series they are to bring new perspectives to our community and to examine ways in which they can challenge and widen our own outlook. Can you speak to the importance of hearing different perspectives, particularly as an author? How has reading and teaching other writers enhanced your own sense of the world and ushered wisdom? When I first started scribbling, when I was very early in my life, I discovered uh, a journal book that I still have that I was looking at yesterday. And it was empty pages, but it had the quotes from the prophet Khalil Gibran, like every 10 pages, right? I'm like, oh, mom, I want this one. And she's like, why? I was like, I don't know. It's like this different perspective. I don't know who this person is but he writes real deep things, right? And I wanted, and so I remember as I started writing as a young girl, I didn't know who he was. We didn't learn about him in school. At this moment where I just was always curious about the world over there. I think major, it has something to do with being born so close to the ocean and the notion of traveling on the ship. And I wasn't even at that point attributing the Atlantic Ocean to my direct history as a black woman uh, born in the South in this country. I was just thinking about, you know, Zora Neale Hurston and the and the, the ships, you know, at, on the horizon and and your how you look how you look at a sea and look at an ocean and when a boat takes off from the shore, all that kind of stuff. So I was always uh, bound by geography as a as a black girl growing up in the south we didn't go any places we didn't get on a plane and travel but books oh came into my life yeah if my father that they, they, i was telling uh last night at chantal's reading i said you know we didn't have bookstores she was like what i was like we didn't have bookstores we had the piggly wiggly and they had a little round thing and it had books on it. And mom said, well, is there anything, you know, as a Nancy Drew or, oh, and then I saw the Khalil Gibran journal. Oh yeah, I want that. I want that. It was different. And then there was a guy who, who drove around the South in a car, big old Cadillac car with a trunk that had books in it. He bought the Encyclopedia Britannica from the book man. He bought Dr. King's uh, uh, something I can't remember later on from the bookman. He brought, he bought all kind of books. I remember he bought um, roots, I didn't, you know, from the bookman. He had opened his truck, and there was there was uh, Alex this book. So I, I was always, you know, my mother didn't let us watch the the stupid box as she called it. She, she really wanted to cultivate this and cultivate that interior that Kevin Kwashi speaks of so eloquently because he's, this is the man, this is a scholar who writes about quiet. So his, his take on this is very slow and methodical and I appreciate it so much, but always thought the inside of me held promise for the rest of my life that I could never get to all of what was there. And I still feel like that, which is why I tell my young writers, you know, you guys are getting tired at like 20 and 30, but I feel like I got 30 more years going here because I keep discovering things about my interiority and about my place in this world, um, you know, the relationship of that. So um, I wanna say that 
for instance, I'm reading Rachel Carson's books over now because I'm writing something about the ocean, right? And I love her so much. And she was, you know, a biologist and an environmentalist and we need her work in the world now more than ever. So I'm reading her again. I've, I've read her um, all my life. Um, I'm thinking of also a Native American history that no one taught me that I am now also ordering books that I need, that I know that I need on the inside of me. Because this world is a cosmology of many cultures and many experiences and many histories, but we don't get that in this world. And when we talk about, it's not just Nashville struggling with what a beloved community is, Columbia, South Carolina is also struggling. We are incredibly separated, which is why I had to fight myself to put that Bernice Johnson Regan piece on the end of that talk, because she talks about how people wanted to name her. Oh, well, you know, why can't we just say it was one word? She's like, it's not one word. We are fighting for the same thing, but we are not the same people. I can't pretend to be something, I mean, I could pretend, but I don't want to pretend to be something I'm not. I wanna be where I am. And then I wanna sit at a table or stand up in the backyard and listen to another perspective and wonder what from that perspective do we need to also include in this beloved community? Mm -hmm. We talk about the beloved community every time it's Dr. King's birthday. Mm -hmm. And then we forget about what we really need to be doing um, to make it so. That doesn't have to do with over there. Mm -hmm. That has to do with inside us. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have to be more willing to be under our own self-critical gaze mm. so that we, I'm always saying to myself, well, I can be better, I can do better than that. I mean, I, I, I okay, I like, I can do better than that. You know, I can just like hear that voice and it's a, it's a muscle you have to like test and realize that you are not, you don't know everything. <laughs> why do, why do all, why do we always think we have all the answers in an intellectual way when really in a historical and a societal and a psychological way, we have to not just make room at the table, but also understand that people can name themselves mm -hmm. and want to, they really want to. Mm -hmm. You're, you mentioned Rachel Carson and, and that is a wonderful kind of lead to this next question. Um, I think it's becoming increasingly clear the critical relationship between social and racial justice and the environmental and health crises we are currently experiencing. How we treat each other correlates with how we treat the land. Right. Somewhere someone said uh, geography is destiny and I'm starting to believe destiny is geography, which is to say, um, we're going to have to take care of this earth if we're going to take care of ourselves. And I've always right. loved and enjoy beginning, you know, with your earliest poems, there's always this undercurrent where you're urging us to kind of pay attention to all forms of life. I mean, it's definitely there in your book, um, Rice, but I'm wondering if, if, if think, thinking about that thread in your work, is that a conscious act on your part, or does it just evolve out of how you've grown thinking about that continuum, thinking about your, your, your nurturance and your reading? Talk to me about that thread, that, that paying attention to uh, the earth, particularly as an act of uh, radical, quiet activism. It's both. It's both in me, and it's also a conscious act. I want to know more. I don't feel like I know enough, but I feel like it's in me innately because of where I was born. And I feel like back to that. I mean, when you read my little bio, it says, you know, she was born by the sea and the, the you know, people say, well, okay, you've had that on there for about 10 years. Do you want to say something else? And I was like, no, <laughs> that, to me, that that's, that's my worldview. And, and when you read Rachel Carson, she talks about the animals that left the sea and went on, you know, on became terrestrial and went on land. And, you know, and then the, 
And then she talks about the ones who then come back and stand on shore and realize that they are made of that water, that we are more water than anything. I mean, those kinds of things just like make total sense to me as someone who was born so close by the ocean, right? But you can also sound kind of crazy, right, Major. You know, you start talking about, well, you, you, you're made of water and you're walking by the ocean and you feel like a creature of the sea, but I'm a poet. You're not going to make me feel that stuff that you don't understand. I understand it, right? And so it is, I am, I am crushed by the news every day, every day about how we are not taking care of Mother Earth. Mm-hmm. People don't understand that without talking about these really hard things and action They think it's just gonna, you know, it's gonna be a TikTok film. We're just gonna like do something else. No, it doesn't work like that. And that's what this pandemic should be teaching us. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are losing so many beautiful, valuable, incredible human beings. And yet, because we don't see that in our sort of, you know, always here, Mm -hmm. it's over there. We think, oh, we'll just, we'll get through it. Mm -hmm. We're losing we're losing so much of our understanding of individual humanity in this moment. And I ho- it's a, it should be a lesson for us. I can't say what's a lesson and not because of who's paying attention and who's not, but I know this always goes back to Baldwin. It always goes back to Baldwin saying, and you know the saying, cause it's you too. It's like the poet, is the only one who knows what it's like to be a human being. The poet, and that's not an exclusivity, you know, exclusivity ticket for us. That's like, okay, wait, let me get to work. Let me do what I need to do. Because he said poet, but he meant artist. If you, if you value the truth, if you tell the truth, humanity needs what you have to say. I can't tell you how nervous I was to, to write what I wrote today because I was, it wasn't like hard on Dr. King <laughs> history that we always hear, right? I'm talking about the women who shaped his consciousness, the, the women that I didn't know, but I have to take a leap of faith and say, I got to bring them in this box, this frame that we are doing because we need the grandmothers now right. more than ever. We need, they have predicted our trouble and our success (laughs) for a long, long time in little things that they dropped in the pot or dropped in the sweet potato pie or said as they went out the door, you know? And that last one that said is the one for me. If I can't Can't help help you, you. (laughs) I'm not gonna hurt you, Major. (laughs) Yes, yes. We need that in this world that is producing so much pain on a daily basis. I want to end with first a quote from June Jordan about Martin Luther King. So I think it resonates with so much that you have uttered both in your talk and, and in the answers to the question. Then I'll, I'll ask the question, but this is what June says. She says, I've come to understand how the very fact of his presence and his achievements among us means that without him, we are not hopeless. Without him, we are not helpless. Because he consecrated his life to the principles of equality and justice, we have become potentially more powerful than the hatred that surrounds and seeks to divide us because he showed us the value of our lives we have become capable of saving them and i want to add to that because those black women showed him the value of his life which is the theme of your talk they saved him and passed it passed it on his in his letter you want to say something about june because i i feel you I, well, feel I knew, right I knew June. I knew June. I know. I have I have some I have some cards from June. I didn't know her, you know, deep, 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 but I knew her. 
And I love that quote. Mm. And I love that quote because she's right. Mm. But you're right too, to add those women who are always left out of the equation and just keep on going about their way. That's right. Now, Ella Baker, Majeska Simpkins, you know, they're like, oh, let me just drop this vitamin down your throat. You don't have to call my name, but my humanity will live on and it will live on in the people who get it. And so I couldn't wait another day to chisel them into this conversation because the church can be a very separate, separating thing. I had to bring Dr. Katie Cannon in because the church and religious thought and feeling and, and community can be a very separating thing. Well, only these people do that and only these people do that. And come on, y'all, mm -hmm. we, we, we have to get beyond that and understand that what has been passed on from so many faucets matters to us now more than ever. We need those many faucets, not just one. Your, that, your words and your life for me have been such an inspiration. Um, there's something deeply spiritual, both in the religious, but also in the secular sense mm. um, about your work, your presence in the world. Um, your walk, mm -hmm. your calling out ancestors, your acknowledging family, your reminding us of those who are in the, just on the edges of the official narrative. That's right. We, we need to widen that book a little yeah. bit more. Yeah. I want to thank you, Nikki Finney, for being a part of this MLK celebration and commemoration and uh, we at Vanderbilt are enormously grateful for your talents. And I personally want to thank you for three decades plus of just fine writing and engaging and provoking me to be a better poet and a better individual, which is what Dr. King's example was all about, wasn't it? Yeah. Major, thank you. I'm so glad you and I um, have been across, sitting across, you know, from each other and having this conversation. I, you know, as my as my father would say, you have to be invited to the table to cause good trouble. <laughs> so I, I, I'm so happy for the invitation from, from Vanderbilt to, you know, to have this moment to talk about something I believe in with all my heart. And, and I just, I'm so thrilled really to be able to just, and exhausted to have this conversation today. And I hope it matters to somebody uh, who's listening in. That's what, that's what really, um, that's, that's the big thing that it spread out back on the ocean, right? right? That it go back into the, the waves of, of that's that's right. That's right. That's right. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you, Nikki and Major for that enlightening discussion. Nikki, we want to thank you again for your time and for sharing your thoughts on Dr. King's legacy. This beloved community is built on radical love. A love that King said can transform an enemy into a friend. That radical love is the responsibility of each and every one of us, not only tonight, but every day of our lives. And as King said, that love may well be the salvation of our civilization. Thanks to everyone watching this virtual event for joining us. Have a good and great evening.